Robinhood Radio and the Robinhood Radio Network is proud to present Leonard Lopate at Large, lively hour-long in-depth discussions providing overviews and context to topics usually covered in partial measures. His guests include leading thinkers, scientists, artists, economists, farmers, historians, authors, and politicians. Mr. Lopate is a Peabody Award winner whose numerous honors include three Associated Press Awards and three James Beard Awards. Welcome to Leonard Lopate at Large. I'm Leonard Lopate. Hugh Ryan's new book, When Brooklyn Was Queer, is an exploration of the borough's LGBT history from the early days of Walt Whitman in the 1850s, when the letters LGBT meant nothing, through years of both acceptance and criminalization, and it ends before the Stonewall riots started the modern era of gay politics. The story includes a wide range of people and places, poets, sailors, undercover cops dressed as sailors, brothels, communes, Nazi spies, and trans men and women. It's published by St. Martin's Press and brings Hugh Ryan to our show. Welcome. Thank you for having me, Leonard. Before we begin, uh, maybe we should uh, decide what words we want to use. Gay is the, <laughs> the, the current word, but uh, you use queer in your title. Do you see them as interchangeable? I don't exactly, and I, I talk about this a little bit in the book. I used queer because I didn't want to call up any specific, you know, we have an image of what a gay person is or what a lesbian is or what a trans person is. Queer is a little less definitive. And particularly when you go back historically, the further back you go, the less those things that we see resemble actually how we ourselves identify today. So I thought queer was a good way to kind of indicate what we were looking at, but not prejudice people. But it also was the operative word at the time that you're covering uh, in this book, in parts Although of it, one yeah. of one of the people you write about, Loop the Loop, preferred fairy. Yes, and yes, that, Loop that was, was a, prever- That's a pejorative. It is a pejorative among some people, but you know, I think she had reclaimed it, and I think many people back then had also reclaimed it. I have a one narrator who actually says in some letters that he writes in like the forties, he says, "Oh, what is this thing homosexual? Can't we just go back to being <laughs> queers?" Didn't this book grow out of an earlier project of yours, the Pop-Up Museum of Queer History? That was 2010. Yes. So what happened? A a pop-up museum? Well, this was, you know, the heart of the financial crisis, and there was tons of space around New York City that was empty and free. And I had this idea that we could do exhibits, community-sourced people creating their own ideas of what it would be to do queer history in a museum, because I hadn't seen that. You know, there had been the hide-seek exhibit at the Smithsonian, there had been protests over it, and I thought, well, what would it look like if queer people had their own museum with their own exhibits, their own content? And we created a whole bunch of different ones, and we tried to do one about Brooklyn and discovered nobody knew anything about Brooklyn's queer history. But you began it in your Bushwick loft Mm -hmm. uh, in response to the Smithsonian's decision to remove David Wojnarowicz's uh, A Fire in My Belly from display. Yeah, that became quite controversial, and it was... uh, a major part of the show that the Museum of Modern Art had. Was it, it the Museum of Modern or the Whitney had recently? Uh, yes, uh, the Whitney just had the retrospective yeah. on Warner Rovich, which is incredible. And I'm a huge fan, and I was really upset when they pulled that piece. And then I realized that I couldn't go see queer art in any major museum in New York City. And I thought, why am I wasting all this time protesting the Smithsonian over this removal of one piece? Why don't I just create what I want to see? But then the, the police shut down yours? They did. Uh, We had about 300 people show up in my loft, which was well beyond fire code. (laughs) And around midnight, I think something like 14 plainclothes cops showed up and shut down the entire party. So you were doing uh, the the general history, and then you decided to do Brooklyn. You say that uh, you uh, and your associates put out a call for information, but got little reply. Mm -hmm. Were people unaware of what turns out to have been this rich history? Absolutely. I mean, most people had a little bit of knowledge. You know, maybe they knew who Walt Whitman was. Maybe they knew that uh, the Lesbian Herstory Archives were in Park Slope or that the bar, the Starlight Lounge, had been an important area for gay black community in um, Crown Heights. But aside from that, particularly when you went further back, they really didn't know anything. And there were no books on it? None. I, went, I actually went to the library thinking, well, I'll go get the book. You know, I thought, mm-hmm. oh, well, probably it was published in you know, the early 80s by Allison or a small gay press, and I would find it, and just nothing, nothing. For as long as I can remember, if you asked most people to name a gay community in New York City, wouldn't they have cited Manhattan neighborhoods like Greenwich Village and Harlem? Yeah, 
Greenwich Village, Harlem, uh, maybe, you know, Chelsea, maybe the Lower East Side, but that was about it. And you say there's been a systematic erasure of Brooklyn's queer history, what you call a great forgetting. Mm -hmm. And erasure by whom? Well, everyone. I mean, one of my favorite examples of this is that there was a bar in Brooklyn, in Brooklyn Heights, uh, that was called the Heights Supper Club. And in the mid-50s, it was a gay bar, and it had one of those systems where there were lights that came on if they were going to be raided to tell people to stop dancing together. And in, I think, 1962, it gets raided and shut down forever by the State Liquor Authority. And the New York Times actually uses this a moment to write this big article about neighborhoods that have high concentrations of homosexuals in New York City. And even though the article is prompted by a raid on a bar in Brooklyn, they only talk about places in Manhattan. And that's it. And the Brooklyn Heights Press actually writes a very short article in response saying, you know, whether you like them or you hate them, no one can deny that homosexuals have a huge history here in the Heights. But nobody at the Times listens. And after that point, even the Brooklyn Heights Press doesn't write about the gay community anymore. But you received a, a grant to research a subject from the Martin Dubamin Fellowship um, in LGBT studies. There's such a thing at the New York Public Library? Oh, yes. And they have some of the greatest resources in the world. I mean, without them, this book wouldn't exist because I wouldn't have access to the history and because that grant really helped me put it together. You said that a recurring theme you found in your research was how Brooklyn's rise in popularity as a place to live mirrored the rise in interest in sex and gender studies and also the rise in homophobia, bigotry, and abuse. Well, it's interesting, right? So New York City, Brooklyn, becomes a city in the, the mid-1800s, you know, after we get the opening of the Erie Canal, which transforms trade in America. That's when Brooklyn really urbanizes. 1855, I kind of put a pin there for Walt Whitman publishing Leaves of Grass. That's where I start my story. But after that is where we start to see this real development all around the country and around the world in this idea of sexuality. People start discussing and naming things. And that happens at the same time that people start discussing Brooklyn. So they track with one another. But although you say that there were no histories of uh, gay life in Brooklyn, uh, there's been a lot written about any number of famous Brooklyn-based gay and bisexual writers. Walt Whitman, Hart Crane, Truman Capote, Carson McCullers, um, a bunch of others as well. Mm -hmm. So um, you, you just had to pick and choose. You had to uh, read a book about uh, a certain house in, downtown, in Brooklyn Heights to, to figure out what was going on? Well, that's definitely part of it. You know, those published uh, books by really famous people helped me a lot because they gave me an in to what was happening. But they're only a very small slice of the actual story. And even in those published books, you know, I'd read books about Walt Whitman that would never mention that he was gay. But Walt Whitman wa was open about it. He was uh, out gay, and he kept a ledger of his waterfront encounters that goes on for over 15 pages. Yes. And you give an example. David Wilson, night of October 11, 62, walking up from Middaw, slept with me, works in a blacksmith shop in Navy Yard. Yeah, uh, the lists are poems. incredible. He also wrote poems <laughs> about his, his gay encounters. Oh, tons of them. The Calamus poems are kind of the most erotic of all of his poems. And, and the Calamus is a flower that's very phallically shaped, uh, which is probably why he chose it. But it's also an allusion to a Greek myth of two lovers, Calamus and Carpus. And Whitman writes all of this into his poems to give people a language to discuss all of this because he's sort of out, he, or at least he's out to people who know him and who he knows the, the same way. But he also destroys a lot of his letters and refuses to speak to some early homophile movement leader. Or not, well, it wouldn't be homophile, it was way too early for that. But, you know, early what we would call gay organizers. Uh, he kind of walks this interesting line. On the other hand, one of his most famous poems, Crossing Brooklyn Ferry, contains uh, a certain... Ode to cruising, he says, saw many I loved in the street or ferry boat or public assembly, yet never told them a word. Mm -hmm. And he talks about the negligent flesh of men leaning against him on the ferry and how he would look forward to those who looked back at him, which is really what cruising is, right? Someone looking back and catching your eye and you catching their eye because you've noticed something about them, the way they linger or the way they walk. And Whitman writes all of that into Leaves of Grass. How much of the early history uh, took place along the Brooklyn waterfront and Brooklyn Heights? In 
the waterfront, most of it, the, the waterfront really provides this economic engine. It's the first parts that really of Brooklyn that get really dense and really city-like, and they have jobs that allow queer people to move away from their families, move away from their homes, create private lives, and be able to live in what we would now say are you know gay lives and also to leave records of it and so that happens all along the waterfront particularly in places where you have these working class bachelor communities of the irish or the italians who are coming here in great numbers but usually really gender imbalanced numbers you got lots of men working together without any place to date women and when did the brooklyn navy yard come along the brooklyn navy yard is um quite quite old. Uh, it's the early 1800s, I believe, when it's founded. So when the fleets came, the fleet came in, uh, there was an influx of sailors. Oh, yeah. From, you know, 1855 and Walt Whitman all the way up, you know, in the 1930s, you get these celebrities who would come to Sand Street in their, you know, chauffeured limousines to get dropped off at the bars where sailors would dance with queers, Tony's Square Bar and the Cabaret. And that was just this incredible attraction. It, in fact, drew people from Manhattan. People would come to Brooklyn to have these kinds of queer experiences in the way that today we might go to Chelsea or to the West Village. You write that a number of Brooklyn landmarks of gay life were destroyed during Robert Moses's construction of the BQE. Uh, that was in the early 60s. So what happened? Well, the BQE, so in general, Robert Moses wanted to suburbanize the city, right? He wanted to make it accessible to people, rich people in cars who were living out in the suburbs. And to do that, he needed to create highways that would get them from Long Island into Manhattan. And so he constructed all of these expressways. If you look at a map of Brooklyn today, you'll see this ring of roads that cuts the entire waterfront off from the rest of Brooklyn. And those were communities at one point, and he shot highways right through them. And that really decimated. You know, the waterfront was already by that point in the 60s going through this downturn. The St. Lawrence Seaway had opened up, so shipping through New York was not that important anymore. And these economically fragile areas then were torn apart by these expressways that were thrown through them and by other changes that he did. You know, he's also in charge of slum clearance and public housing, and he used those powers to kind of decimate poor communities, and queer people tended to be poor. So they started cruising on the, the promenade. Yes, when the BQE was, was built, the promenade became almost overnight, according to everything I've read, a real cruising ground because there already was such a big gay male population in Brooklyn Heights, and now there was a new space for them. And what was the reaction of people in the neighborhood who saw this as a place for their families to walk? You know, a lot of them were very supportive. Again, the Brooklyn Heights Press has all of these letters. Some people wrote in to complain, and, you know, they called them the, the princes of the promenade and how they would hit on them and, and, you know, freak them out. And people actually wrote back and said, you know what? Like, they've been here for a really long time, and they're good neighbors, and we like the homosexuals in Brooklyn Heights. One a married man described them as cultured, quiet, and amiable. A credit to our community. <laughs> what I think is amazing about that letter is that guy actually signed his name. In fact, all of the people who were supportive of the queer community in the Heights signed their names to those letters to the Brooklyn Heights Press, whereas a lot of the people who were criticizing the queer community refused to sign their names. You note that uh, the start of the construction of the Brooklyn Bridge in 1869 occurred in the same year that uh, a journalist named Carl Maria Kurt Benny, was it? <laughs> First used the terms homosexual and heterosexual. Were they being used in the same way as they are today? Yes, he was starting to define them really in the same way we would use them today in Germany, uh, though they do take on, you know, heterosexuality was a, a sort of a, a morbid somatic state of like overwhelming heterosexuality. It wasn't just what we talk about today in terms of sexuality, but it was the same concept. Didn't some of the, the best sources of information for your research come from uh, some people who hated the LGBT community? Oh, yes. I mean, a lot of what you have to do when you're researching queer history is sort of w what we say is work against the archive. So you've got this uh, record of police arrests that maybe will tell you, oh, hey, all these arrests are happening in one neighborhood. Maybe that's a queer neighborhood. Maybe I should go look closer there. Or all of these doctors who write these incredibly homophobic and transphobic screeds against the people they're researching but they also collected information from them, right? So you've got to balance these two things together and take everything with a bit of a grain of salt. And one of the uh, groups was called the Committee of 14. <laughs> and they uh, w weren't just uh, opposed to homosexuals in the community. They also uh, were, well, they were fighting pro for prohibition yep. and uh, against uh, 
straight prostitutes, and then they discovered that there was a homosexual community and went after them as well. Uh, you say that although you considered them crazy, we wouldn't know some of the history without the records they kept. Oh, absolutely. I mean, they were obsessed with record keeping. They would send informants into bars all over the city to find out what was happening, and they would have these informants write up these long sets of notes. Their original thought was that they would um, end drinking among working class people by banning the sale of alcohol on Sundays, except in hotels. And so every bar basically cut up their back room and declared themselves a hotel so they could get around this rule because a large hotel was allowed to serve alcohol under the idea that rich people went to large hotels to get alcohol on Sundays. And so once they did this, once they cut up all of these little rooms into hotel rooms, suddenly there were all these private spaces where men and women could meet, men and men could meet. It was a little harder for women and women to meet just because they were women were not often allowed into these bars unless they were escorted by men. But that was where the Committee of 14 started off. They were like, we're going to shut down those quote-unquote hotels that are really just bars. And as they started to raid those places, they discovered all kinds of immorality in them, not just the heterosexual prostitution and the drinking they were going after, but also homosexuality, which they kept close track on all throughout the 19-teens and 1920s, really up until the end of Prohibition. I'm speaking with Hugh Ryan about his book, When Brooklyn Was Queer, published by St. Martin's Press. This is Leonard Lopate at Large on WBAI, New York 99.5 FM. Is most of the history from that time about, uh, when we're talking about Brooklyn gay life, about white men? It depends on what time you're talking about, but yes. I mean, the big thing that was a surprise to me in doing this research at the very beginning was to discover how white Brooklyn really was historically. That for large portions of time between the end of slavery in New York in the early 1800s and basically the 1940s, Brooklyn was always around 97, 98, 99% white. And that was shocking to me because that's obviously not the Brooklyn of today. And in general, white people and white men had more access to money, more access to culture, more access to things that would preserve their legacies. And so their histories just get preserved even better. So we have first off more of them and then their histories get preserved more. And then we think to look at their histories for queer history more. And so it kind of plays upon itself at every level. I would think also people of color were seen as negligible at this time, and lesbians were kind of invisible. Obviously, still true today that lesbians are often invisible. You know, the same people we were just talking about, the Committee of 14, they're really looking at gay male sex and they're going after it, but they don't really have much of an understanding of lesbians, and it's not really a social problem for them, so they don't record it. You get more about lesbians when you get into doctor's reports and psychologist's reports. Uh, and the Committee of 14, they knew that people of color were having queer sex and, um, you know, being part of the prostitution networks that existed. But they said in their own reports, they said, you know, it's not really worth it for the police to go bust people of color because rarely do they have the money to be shaken down effectively. And so why would they ever go to those communities? So, so much of this was also about <laughs> people being shaken down by the cops. Oh, yes. Yeah, there was a big racket. I mean, you know, sometimes it's really organized, as in the mafia rackets in, you know, New York City gay bars that you get in the 40s and the 50s and the 60s. But it's a complaint going back as far as you can. There's one point uh, in the, like, mid-1800s where uh, the mayor of Brooklyn writes this long article on New Year's Day about how fantastic— This is before Brooklyn becomes part of New York City. Yeah, Yeah. when when it's still its own city. He writes about how fantastic Brooklyn is in every single way, and the only thing he disparages are the cops. He's like, oh, the cops? Well, you know— One of the most fascinating locations in the story is the February house, the the Brooklyn townhouse that was um, home to uh, some of the most famous writers of the time. Oh, yeah. 1940, George Davis gets this idea that he's going to open up a communal house where he can live and write, and he invites in some of his friends. He was a Harper's Bazaar editor. Mm -hmm. And he'd written a book uh, a little bit earlier. I think in 1929 he published his book. And he brought in Carson McCullers, who was a fiction writer that he had published, And he brought in Gypsy Rose Lee, the burlesque star, who was a close friend of his from when they were teenagers. She also was a writer. He, in fact, helped her write her book, The G-String Murders, in February House. And then uh, W.H. Auden, Benjamin Britten, and his partner Peter Pierce. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's where uh, Oliver Smith, the set designer, who was just 22, met Leonard Bernstein. Yeah, and Oliver Smith, you know, goes on to be one of the most important set designers of the 20th century. West Side Story is one of his 
on the town. And all of these, he says, are inspired by his time in Brooklyn. He, in fact, says at one point that West Side Story was really more Brooklyn than Manhattan, but don't tell anyone. So were all of or most of the residents of the February House gay or, or bisexual? Most of them, yeah. Some were not. Richard Wright moves in later. Uh, he was not, as far as I have any evidence. You know, Gypsy Rose Lee, definitely her mother was uh, involved with other women, and Gypsy had very strong emotional relationships with women, but nothing that I can see was ever sexual or romantic. And Carson McCullers was bisexual. Mm-hmm. She's married, but also liked women. Yes, and Sarah Shulman actually has a really interesting piece in The New Yorker talking about the gender troubles that Carson McCullers had and that maybe she actually was a, a trans individual. There's a lot wow. of queerness there, but nothing so specific. Again, going back to that use of queer. Were the neighbors of, of the February House aware of how famous the residents were? You know, it's a little hard to tell. Definitely by the time that they were living there, the part of the heights that they were in was was not fancy. They talk about how nearby one of the houses had been turned into a candy store and a couple were abandoned. And that one of the things they all really loved about it was the privacy it gave them. The being there kind of was anonymous as compared to living in Greenwich Village. But there were other places. There were Hamilton Easter Field created an art commune in Brooklyn Heights and Hart Crane and John Dos Passos were there. Oh, yeah. This is, when you think of all of these uh, incredible names, all living in Brooklyn Heights at the same time, you really wonder why more hasn't been written about this. Yeah, Hamilton Easter Field is particularly interesting because he was a scion of Brooklyn, you know, comes from this really important Brooklyn family, and his, his father built the field mansion that he lived in, and he purchased all these buildings in the early 1900s, and he connected them to create this Ardsley School and invited all of these artists to live there. He had done the same thing earlier in Ogunquit, and this was in the early 1920s, you know, and he starts an art magazine and he's a patron to artists around the world. And one of the buildings that he purchases is actually the same building that Washington Roebling lived in while he was finishing the Brooklyn Bridge, 110 mm-hmm. Columbia Heights. So it starts off with Washington Roebling. Then you have Hamilton Easter Field buying it. And then in moves Hart Crane. And he moves into the exact room from which Washington Roebling constructed the bridge. And the bridge is Hart Crane's uh, idol. He loves it. It's the most important thing in New York City. He writes a whole epic poem, his masterwork, The Bridge, dedicated to the Brooklyn Bridge. He wasn't the only one who wrote odes to the bridge. It was uh, considered one of the the great feats of the time. We even did a show about the, uh, the creation of the Brooklyn Bridge here. Um, but you, you focus on what life was like for some of the ordinary queer folks um, as well. Um, I mentioned Loop the Loop earlier. Uh, she was a trans woman and sex worker uh, at a time when trans was not part of the vocabulary. Right. She would have been called a fairy, maybe, or an yeah. invert. And she called herself a fairy. She did, yeah. And the doctors did, too. And she worked on the streets. She was a street-level streetwalker. She was interviewed by this one doctor, R.W. Schufelt, for 11 years. So she had a very extended career. And over the course of that, she said she was never arrested. There were many other girls working with her. And that the boys didn't mind her body hair. They didn't mind being with a trans woman. Then there were drag kings, uh, Ella Wesner and Florence Hines. Uh, They were, and we're talking about the, the late 19th century. Right. Entertainers have always been a source of queer presence in American culture. There's always been a place in variety and vaudeville and the legitimate stage for exceptional, assertive, masculine women and feminine men. Now, sometimes that place is mocking and sometimes it's uh, gently making fun of, you know, and sometimes it's hateful and sometimes it's hopeful. But those entertainers form some of the earliest queer history we can find. Men who... uh were also female impersonators like, uh, what was it, Foley McKeever? <laughs> the great Ricardo, as he performed under, yes. And that was also 19th century. And, and so this was just part of the uh, basic entertainment of downtown Brooklyn? Yeah, when Foley McKeever died in the, I think it was like 1883, he has three priests at his funeral because he's so famous. And he's a drag queen who works in blackface. He works in minstrel shows. And none of that gets mentioned. But the priests are really concerned that he was an actor. And so his funeral is all about how you can be an actor and still be a good person. But no one makes any bones about the kind of acting he's doing because that actually didn't matter to them that much. 
There was E. Trundle, a transgender man whose arrest in Brooklyn was headline news for weeks in 1913. Why did it, was it headline news? He wasn't the only person, I'm assuming, uh, who was arrested, uh, who was gay. Oh, no. Cross-dressing arrests were very popular at this time. Uh, they would call it uh, masquerading in girls' clothes or masquerading in boys' clothes. But Trondle, when he was arrested, refused to wear women's clothing, though the court tried to make him, refused to give his name, and refused to cooperate in any way, and said, I'm going to write to President Woodrow Wilson and demand the right to wear pants and to dress as a man and to present myself as a man because I will be happier and I will be able to make money. And that's what makes him famous. Newspapers around the country report this letter that he writes from jail begging Woodrow Wilson because... He knew the story of this surgeon who had, during the Civil War, been given the right to wear pants, uh, Dr. Mary Walker. And so he kind of patterned his request on that. He was just a um, hundred-something years ahead of his time. <laughs> if you, you walk around uh, this whole area, I don't think you'll see one woman in a skirt or, <laughs> or a dress in this weather. Uh, Everybody's uh, wearing pants. Oh, yeah, yeah. And I think what's really really interesting about that story is that the day after he's sentenced, his first magistrate says, you know what, you're actually right. You have the right to wear pants. It's not illegal for women to wear pants. It's illegal for someone to wear a woman to wear pants while committing another crime, though. So he gets released, and he gets immediately rearrested, and they find a new magistrate who sets him up on, you know, bogus charges. But the next day, this person writes in and sort of gives this long op-ed about how there are people who want to dress in the clothing of the opposite sex, and they are timid individuals, and we have to protect them and take care of them. And that's actually a trans woman named Othili Spengler who connects all of these trans people all around the country. She writes all of these letters, participates in studies. And I thought it was fascinating to see her coming to the defense of this other trans person publicly in the newspapers in 1913. And where did you find this material? Did you have to pour through newspapers looking for anything that suddenly uh, <laughs> you said, well, hey, this may be for me? Yeah, you know, you, I started a whole long list of verbiage that I would look for. Uh, mannish is an obvious mm -hmm. one. You know, effeminate is another one. Masquerading is a big one that would come up a lot. And then weird terms like DC-8, which used to refer to a gay man. Uh, and it was actually police code. DC was for disorderly conduct, and 8 was for the subsection of disorderly conduct that outlawed soliciting another man for lewdness. Then there was Mabel Hampton, a black lesbian who worked as a dancer in Coney Island in the 20s. Was she famous at the time? She was not famous at the time, though she did get later involved uh, in a major way in the Harlem Renaissance, and she performed at places like the uh, Garden of Joy and... 1920, when she was at Coney Island, she danced in the sideshow, and she first learned the word lesbian there from another woman, uh, and she had this incredible life that was made possible in part by the subway itself, which in 1920 had recently become just as cheap to go to Coney Island as it had anywhere else. I was uh, really interested in Josiah Marvel, who was a curator at the Brooklyn Museum. Joe Marvel was not only a curator at the Brooklyn Museum, he was a conscientious objector during World War II. He was a real Quaker. He had this strong sense of belief. And he organized all throughout the war to help conscientious objectors, war wives, orphans, uh, all these people who were sort of part of the war or affected by the war but weren't soldiers. He is actually the only person who was able to get into some of the Nazi-controlled prisons in France. And after the war, he realized that there was one group of men returning from the war that no one was helping. And those were men who had been discharged from the army because of their sexuality. And he actually took the organization that he'd founded, the Quaker Emergency Services, and he turned the whole thing to helping these men and working with the court systems and providing an alternative to detention program. So if you were arrested for soliciting and you would instead be sent to his program instead of jail. One of the, the fascinating aspects of this story is how accepted the queer community was in Brooklyn at certain periods and by certain people, and then at other times uh, has real problems. Uh, we will um, continue this conversation in just a moment. This is Leonard Lopit at Large. We're back to, with Hugh Ryan, his book, When Brooklyn Was Queer, which is uh, published by, well, this is published by a major publisher, St. Martin's Press. Uh, normally these books wind up in some kind of small press. Yeah, we really lucked out. I have to say St. Martin's Press took a chance on me. Uh, every other editor we sent it to rejected the proposal. They were the only ones who were interested, and they have supported this book in an incredible way. 
during Prohibition, gay and straight bars merged. I didn't know that. It was assumed by the people I grew up with, also in Williamsburg, that there was a fair amount of same-sex activity in the Brooklyn Navy Yard where there were a lot of bars. Right. But well, this is after Prohibition. But what, what happened during Prohibition? Was it just if you wanted to drink, you were com committing a crime no matter what, so it didn't matter whether he was straight or gay? Exactly. When we criminalize the behaviors of straight white men, the people with most privilege, suddenly everyone else is freed up to a certain degree because there's nowhere you can go to be safe. So now, why not go to a gay bar? Maybe it'll be interesting. Or there weren't really gay bars then, but bars that had more gay people in them. And you say that before World War II, especially in the 20s, there were a lot more spaces where queer and non-queer people could mix. But then New York criminalized same-sex activity in 1923, making it a misdemeanor to frequent or loiter about any public place soliciting men for the purposes of committing a crime against nature or other lewdness. Mm -hmm. It's that same group, the Committee of 14, who we discussed before. They worked with doctors and lawyers to pass this law, which was based on a law that they had passed earlier to arrest prostitutes. And it's this important change. All of our laws before that that we use to sort of criminalize homosexuality are based on a behavior. You're wearing a costume that's not right. You're hitting on another person. You're uh, having sex in the street. You're being disorderly, all of this. But this law makes it a crime to solicit or to be seen as looking to solicit. So basically, if you look like a prostitute, you can be arrested. If you look like a gay man in public, you can be arrested. And that's a big change. So were people, uh, were the cops raiding the Coney Island working class gay bathhouses? No. Because by the 1920s, you point out, the Nickel Empire started attracting large crowds of gay men to its bathhouses. And in 1929, Washington Baths held a male beauty contest, oh, this which is Variety a covered. Hilarious story. I mean, they had no idea what they were getting into, right? They thought they were going to hold this contest and that it would be full of women from Coney Island looking at beautiful men. And instead, as they started, they realized the entire audience basically was men. And that as the men signed up, and over 40 men signed up to participate, they were all doing it in makeup, in full drag. These were decidedly gay men who knew that they were in a gay space. They were willing to be public about it, right? That's the really fascinating thing. So they felt safe enough to come in huge numbers. And the crowd really was excited by it. It was only the folks coming from Manhattan, the Variety organizers, who were really freaked out by this gay presence. Variety reported that the hardest part of judging the competition was picking a male butte who wasn't a floozy. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, the... Uh, uh, and during the 40s, Coney Island was known as, uh, at least parts of it, were known as Muscle Beach. Right. So after World War II, the 40s and into the 50s, you get all these physique pictorial magazines, right? These are communities that are kind of on the skids at this point. And for the young men who hang out there, mostly Italian and Irish and eventually Puerto Rican, m modeling was a way to make money and a way to kind of get out of that community. And so they were really willing to model for all of these different men with cameras, some of whom were gay. So if a, a young a gay man wanted to meet other men, he, he would kind of know where to go? It depends. Uh, some of them did, some of them didn't. You heard through the grapevine, you might not even know or think of yourself as gay, and you might not hear about a place that was necessarily gay, but you sort of found other people like you. And there were certain areas, you know, any place where lots of men end up naked together, it's going to end up being gay. So subway bathrooms and bathhouses at Coney Island, those are really obvious places to go. But also uh, Prospect Park, the, the Vale of Kashmir, which is quite popular these days. It became a cruising ground in the 1940s? Yep. Uh, after World War II, again, that's when you see this crackdown that starts. Around the Navy Yard, in the Army, you get this homophobia that was not there before. And so it has to move away from Sand Street. It has to move away from the Navy Yard itself. And you start finding all of these gay men cruising in Prospect Park, in the part that's closest to the Navy Yard. Mm -hmm. And then uh, you have, uh, uh, in an October 1945 letter to the mayor, a precinct commanding officer warned of the growing menace of sex degenerates in Prospect Park, Brooklyn. All right. Then, you know, 1945 through the Stonewall Riots, 1969 is the most homophobic time in American history. And you get all of these people who are being taught that you have to police yourself and each other for any presence of gay people. And you have to report on it. Was one of the, the reasons the end of Prohibition? The repeal of Prohibition? Yeah, the repeal of Prohibition basically took these spaces that had, you know, as we talked about, been mixed because it's illegal to drink anywhere, so it doesn't matter if you're with queer people in the room, 
prohibition ends and suddenly it's illegal to be in a gay bar and it's legal to be in a straight bar. And so that's when you really get this division. You lose these mixed spaces and you start to get these hard and fast gay and straight bars. It was a time also when the concepts, the ideas of eugenics became really popular. Were they being used to explain this degenerate behavior? Yes, and it actually comes a lot from white supremacy, which I think we rarely think about white supremacy as the origin of trans and homophobia. But these eugenic doctors were really concerned about preserving the white race. And they saw black people as a threat to the white race from the outside, that they would intermarry and thereby cause the degeneration. But they saw queer people, and particularly people who were gender nonconforming in any way, as a threat from the inside. They would lead to sterility and insanity. And so you had to police the way straight people had sex in order to prevent them from having sex with people of the wrong race or giving birth to people of the wrong sexuality. And wasn't it also argued that homosexuals were dangerous to the health of the nation, easily blackmailed and not to be trusted? Oh, yeah. Joseph McCarthy really pushes this in the 50s. You know, he's the Red Scare, but also the Lavender Scare going after gays. But he perfects a playbook that's established in New York City by an organization called the Rap Coderre Committee in 1940. And they really go after communist professors all around the city, but particularly in Brooklyn College, a number of whom are gay. And they find ways to criminalize their existence and to push them out of public uh, teaching, out of public jobs. That was when Brooklyn College was in downtown Brooklyn before it moved to Flatbush. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in the first uh, decade, basically, of its existence. So did this lead to a, a lot more men being or and women being closeted? Or, or had that always been part of the, uh, the, the story? I think part of what you get in the, the start of the, the 20th century is this idea of homosexuality starts to spread. You've got psychologists, you've got Freud, you've got the army, all of these people telling you there is heterosexuality and there is homosexuality. And once that takes hold, that's when you start to have the closet because then people start to say, well, oh, I am that thing, but I'm going to pretend not to be that thing. And how uh, you say in, by the 1940s, thousands of men were being arrested each year for degeneracy. So what was happening? Do they, was there a special jail? Uh, there actually were special wings in most jails for gay men, for effeminate gay men mm -hmm. and trans uh, women. And particularly here in Rikers, there was one. Uh, and you see that also true for butches in women's jails. There Rarely are there separate areas, but they are um, To protect flagged. the straight men. To protect the straight men and um, many times to sort of keep them from, from per perverting everyone else. You uh, cite a notable case from 1942 when Senator David Ignatius Walsh's career was destroyed by rumors that he had frequented a gay Brooklyn brothel at 329 Pacific Street. Uh, well, that would be Borum Hill, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, that was being used by Nazi spies. Yes, yeah, Walter Winchell called it the Swastika Swishery, which I think is the best terrible name. And the Office of Naval Intelligence had actually been watching this brothel for months because they thought that maybe it was being used by spies. And when they raided it, they caught the noted um, composer Virgil Thompson there and a number of sex workers and the man who owned the brothel. And they spent months trying to lean on this guy who owned the brothel to get him to identify the senator and to admit that there were financial backers and because they couldn't believe that you would make that much money off of a brothel for male prostitutes. It just didn't make sense to them, right? And so they gin up this whole story. I mean, it's, it's, it's all faked, unfortunately, in the end, but it ruins many men's lives. Including the brothel's owner, Gustav Beekman, who um, was one of the people arrested. He cooperated with the authorities, and that didn't help. No. It, when he refused to name these non-existent financial backers who the authorities were convinced were providing money, they sent him to a maximum security Sing Sing prison for 20 years. It was one of the reasons that uh, they went after uh, David Ignatius Walsh, uh, that he was opposed to going to war? It wasn't one of the main reasons they went after I mean, the, him, but it was one of the... You say the New York the, Post really focused on that. It was one of the things that made him vulnerable, right? It wasn't a major part of the scandal itself, but it already pre predisposed people to dislike him. And so that made it easy for them to attack him. You uh, write, uh, the legacy of all of this is when we get this turn towards homophobia, 1945 to Stonewall, or the early 80s, there is this really negative idea that gay life is sad, small, limited, dirty, painful, persecuted. And I think that we have internalized that. Anytime before Stonewall, 
that was what gay life was when re- really it was just what gay life was like when gay life was becoming speakable in most of America and getting its history written. So was uh, Brooklyn any different than the rest of the country? I mean, the whole country was different in many different ways. Brooklyn, obviously, as an urban space, as a place of all of this intermingling, I think had more queer history and more exposure to a lot of this stuff. But all throughout the world, in, in, well, all throughout America, from 45 on, you get this turn towards homophobia and this this negative idea of homosexuality that's really what I grew up inside you know growing up in the 80s I was taught that as far back as you can go gay life was the same as it is now and that what it is is small and sad and dirty and unsafe mentally ill psychologically stunted right but we didn't even have those terms like psychologically stunted before the 19 teens so obviously it couldn't have always been that thing but I was raised with this ahistoric idea that said no what Gay life is in, you know, 1963 is what it has always been. Well, it was at at a certain point people were being sent into conversion therapy uh, as though this is something that could be cured. Oh, yes. And, you know, a lot of these people going back, uh, Joe Marvel, who I, I love so much and did so much for so many men, started off thinking, looking for a way to cure homosexuality. And he actually comes to believe that if he can figure out what's wrong with gay adults and he can start working with children under the age of seven, he can prevent them from becoming gay. He doesn't think you can be cured, but he thinks you can be stopped. It's a Freudian idea. Mm-hmm. Yeah, a lot of this comes from Freud. I mean, I, I, I love many things that Freud did, and he in some ways enabled us to talk about sexuality as being separate from gender, but he also taught us a lot of ways that sexuality was um, dangerous and sad and... and um, yeah, he had a lot of negative views, not so much among himself, but in his followers. So... During this time, there were gay bars. I remember um, I went to Pratt, and <laughs> sometimes people would say, hey, you want to go to this gay bar? Uh, because uh, that was part of the cultural scene of New York. But there was always the fear that there would be a police raid. Right, right. And that's you know what, what prohibition does, right? It leaves gay bars raidable because the state liquor authority says it's not legal. It's automatically a disorderly house if you're serving gay people. There's a number of the other places that you write about here uh, were part of just normal Brooklyn life, like the Hotel St. George, which uh, was the the favorite had the favorite swimming pool of all of the poor kids that I grew up with in Williamsburg. Oh, that pool is so beautiful, too. And there are parts of it that are still there inside the Eastern Athletic Gym, if you go to look today. But you, it was once the largest hotel in the country? Mm-hmm. Largest hotel in the country and probably the most storied cruising ground in Brooklyn's history. I mean, men would go there for decades to seduce other men. Uh, I can find records of you know the, the poet uh, Harold Norse going there, being brought there by his professor, David McKelvey White, who is a communist organizer and professor at Brooklyn College, in order to seduce him. This was a place that people knew to go to find other gay men. And you even cite the subway station in front of the Hotel St. George, the Clark Street station. Hart Crane writes about the, the seductions of the Clark Street subway station. You know, it was a known place. Basically, when the city built the subway, they created this giant network of small rooms where men could be naked with other men. And there's no better way to promote gay sex than by creating the subway bathrooms. So Hart Crane actually uh, wrote about uh, that a friend loved Brooklyn Heights because of the attractions of the St. George subway station. And then he later alluded to it in The the Bridge, Mm -hmm. describing love as a burnt match skating in a urinal. Wow. <laughs> Woo. Yeah. Hart Crane, uh, you know, his mother unfortunately destroyed a lot of his letters and a lot of his pornography and erotic stuff. But what we have indicates the great extent of cruising in Brooklyn as well as around the world. He cruised everywhere he went. <laughs> we are uh, not far from where there was a uh, one of the first recorded police raids of a Brooklyn bar frequented by gay men, uh, an undercover officer posing as a sailor was invited to a building on Skirmerhorn Street by a group of men. Uh, so Skirmerhorn Street is just two blocks away from the WBAI studios. Yeah, yeah. they uh, started off at 32 Sand Street, which was a bar for sailors near the Brooklyn Navy Yard. And they had been watching it, the Committee of 14 again, and the police had been watching it for weeks. 
And because the laws back then required you to do something, you couldn't just arrest a person for being gay. They hit on this great idea to arrest, to take a police officer, dress him in a sailor's uniform, and send him in to flirt with the guys. And if the guys hit on him, then he could arrest them. And so he went in, he flirted with a bunch of guys who said, if you come down to 150 Shermerhorn Street, we'll suck your cock. And then he arrested all of them. The raid took about 15 minutes. He arrested six guys and the bartender. Sorry you used that word, but... Uh, anyway, uh, there was uh, there were a number of other famous places, but you, one of them uh, you kind of mentioned it slightly before, the Starlight Lounge. Uh, this is a little uh, later, but it was a place uh, that welcomed black gay clientele. Where was that? Uh, the Starlight Lounge is in Crown Heights, and it was around for. 50 years. Uh, it's only recently closed down. There's a great documentary about the history of it called We Came to Sweat, uh, if you want to know more. It's really fantastic. And it was the first gay bar in that area, but a number opened up around it as well. So what happened to the, the pop-up museums? Uh, did, uh, did that end in, in, within a couple of months? We did it actually for a, a number of years. We did them all around New York, and we did one in Philly and Indiana, and I went to Sweden and talked about it. But after a while, the organizing of it really had to take a backseat to doing research for this book. Well, could you just as easily have done when Philadelphia was que was queer or when Atlanta was ge was queer? I really hope someone else is working on those we, books right now because I know San Francisco. In San Francisco. <laughs> I know in Philadelphia there's a ton of queer history that's fascinating. But do you think that Brooklyn has become one of the epicenters of queer life in America? Oh, yes. I think today Brooklyn is queerer than it's ever been. You know, people often ask me, why did you call it when Brooklyn was queer? It's queer now. And I say that for me, I grew up in a time where you wouldn't think about Brooklyn and queer history at all. And in fact, you would rarely think about Brooklyn as a place anyone went to for anything. You kind of came from Brooklyn. You didn't go to Brooklyn. But today... Brooklyn is this epicenter for queer culture, for drag, for art, for writers, for community, and that's really exciting. All over the, the borough? I think so. And no longer just Brooklyn Heights and the, the waterfront and a few other Yeah, spots. the waterfront sort of Coney had its Island story. Coney Island is over. I wouldn't say Coney Island is over, but it definitely is not what it was in the 1920s when it was the place that everyone in New York City went. So uh, everything changed with, with the Stonewall riots? Yes, although everything had already changed. You know, I, I think that's the, the great thing about this history is you see waves, and it changes in major ways. But when the Stonewall riots came along, by that point we'd had so much homophobia and so much hatred that things sort of exploded into the riots and into a number of other clashes between queer people and cops in the late 1960s and early 70s. Now, I, I would say that generally if you took a poll of Americans today, um, people aren't all that upset about homosexuality. But there are still an awful lot of people who are homophobic. Uh, why do you think that lingers? I think it's a lot of reasons. I mean, I think we're taught many, many things that aren't necessarily strictly about homophobia, but we're sort of taught to hate anyone who's too gender nonconforming, right? And that's connected to homophobia, but you might make fun of someone for being feminine and say, I'm not making fun of them for being gay. I'm making fun of them for being feminine, right? And I think those things linger. And I also think that, you know, while young people today coming up may be taught a certain way of thinking about sexuality, many of us, like myself, grew up with a much older way of thinking. And those ways of thinking don't just disappear because the mainstream changes. This is something that uh, we can note very early in people's lives. I remember there was a, a very good-looking young man named Boy, mm -hmm. named Lance, maybe in the fifth grade or so, and all the boys would... Uh, go up to him and say, will you marry me? <laughs> wow. Now, we're talking about little kids. Yeah. B because already the, the fact is that he, he stood out. He was not like everybody else. He was very effeminate, mm -hmm. very pretty. Uh, and who knows what happened in his life. But um, I, I don't know if that's homophobia. I mean, I don't want to make a direct connection between being gender nonconforming and sexuality, but certainly the further you go back in history, the more that we see that it's, it's gender nonconforming behaviors that we penalize and that we criminalize. And sometimes that gender nonconforming behavior is sexual, but sometimes it's just about how you walk or dress or talk. Well, on the other hand, we had people like Franklin Pangborn in our movies. Uh, he was the stereotypical gay character, and he was always there as... Um, just a part of the, the, the usual mix, whether we, he was going to be the officious hotel uh, 
uh, clerk or whether he was going to be somebody amusing uh, in the office. Right. We've always had room for those kind of stereotypical characters going all the way back to variety. Queer people play a part in American theater, American stage. It may not be recognized that they're queer, but certainly the mannish woman or the effeminate man. In the 1930s, there was actually a craze, the pansy craze, for having effeminate men in movies. And Franklin Pangborn, he was just one of them, but uh, he's the one, uh, uh, I think, who stood out the most. You have... um you also have some pictures in the book. Where did you find the pictures? The pictures took a lot of work. <laughs> I will say there were not a lot of images to find. And I took about six years doing the research for this book. So I would note down any time I came across, you know, paintings by Edward Casey, a little known painter who lived in Brooklyn from World War I up through, I think, the early 60s and painted these beautiful canvases of naked men, white and black together on the East River. And as far as I know, Casey was married to a woman. There's nothing I can find about his own sexual history, but he's either recording these really homoerotic moments that he was seeing on the river, or he's picturing homoerotic fantasies. And so when I found his paintings, I thought, oh, I've got to show these. You know, we don't know a lot about them. They're obviously queer to someone looking at them today, but we don't really know exactly what they mean. And then you have um, a picture of a theater, the... uh the Park Theater, Colonel Sin's Park Theater, at, uh, on, that was on Fulton Street. Um, did they feature gay characters? You would occasionally gay find performers? fairies as characters in stock performances. You know, again, these, these stereotypical characters, the same way you might find the drunken Irish Paddy, you'd find the effeminate fairy. But they had a lot of performers, uh, particularly in the early 1900s. Some of the most um, connected lesbian communities I was able to find were these networks of performers like John Stone Bennett, who uh, had sort of masculine looks and they took on masculine roles in plays and in vaudeville. And they traveled the country and they connected groups of women all throughout America. And so they were really important. And the theaters, which in Brooklyn were clustered in downtown Brooklyn and in Coney Island were places for them to gather and places where they were known and places where you would see their posters and maybe you would wait outside the stage door if you saw a masculine woman on stage and she evoked in you something that you were like, I feel a connection. You would wait outside the stage door in Brooklyn Heights to meet her. Downtown Brooklyn, uh, Fulton Street uh, has had an interesting history. Uh, In fact, there's Albee Square named after the Albee family. There was the RKO Albee, and I remember talking to Edward Albee, who's one of the greatest playwrights America's produced, and Mm -hmm. he talked about what a disappointment he was to his parents. They adopted him when he turned out to be gay. Mm. One of my favorite little details that I found in researching this book was that Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, the Albee play, was actually based on a couple in Brooklyn, Moss and Mencken, uh, Willard Moss and Marie Mencken, who were artists and filmmakers. They made some of the earliest experimental films in America. And Willard Moss was bisexual, and they had they fought a lot about this. And that's what he based the co- main couple uh, in Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf on. We have just uh, about two minutes more. Is there anything we've left out that you think is really important? The one thing I do want to say is that I worked closely with the Brooklyn Historical Society in this book, in the research. They have been huge supporters, and they actually helped me to take the material from this book and create a companion exhibit. So up right now in the Brooklyn Historical Society are images, paintings, photos, and more information about many of the characters in this book, and some people aren't actually even in the book. And you can go and check that out, and it'll be open through August 4th. So for people who maybe don't want to sit down and read an entire book, this is a good way to get an intro to some of the subject. And it's also a great place. What I would really recommend and ask is to bring schools and to ask your school to buy this book, because that's where I learned queer history first was through my school and through my school library. And that was What school was doing that? Well, it wasn't necessarily a good kind of learning, but it was definitely a learning. Uh, I went to public high schools outside New York, up in Westchester, public elementary school, and we definitely learned about Walt Whitman and many other people. And so it's important to me that this information be accessible to people that age. My guest has been Hugh Ryan. His book, When Brooklyn Was Queer, is published by St. Martin's Press. And uh, it's sad that some people don't want to read books, but uh, I suspect a lot of people will find this really fascinating history. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. This is wonderful. ¶¶
And that brings us to the end of today's show. My great thanks to Hugh Ryan, to Charlie Morrow, who composed our theme music, to Reggie Johnson, who was at the audio controls, and to my executive producer, Jesse Lent. What a little bit of large comes to you on Saturdays at 4 and Tuesdays at noon. You can subscribe to Leonard Lopate at Large Podcasts on iTunes and by clicking on Robin Hood Radio's archive program site, which is robinhoodradio.com. You can also check out Leonard Lopate at Large Facebook page. We hope to see you next week. <laughs>